Dear God, I'd like to ask that you will please somehow enter our minds that through the Holy Spirit your word will be clear. We won't just take it as words, but that we will allow it to be a power, a power that has a true effect, an effect that makes a difference in what happens on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, every day. And even now, do that work, O oh God, that we had not come here in vain, but that God will be God in our lives. Amen. Okay. Like to work out? Everybody who loves to work out, just do that. Well, I'm seeing a few. What about the rest of you? Coach, couch potatoes? You can try that as well like to work out. You know that the Bible says, work out your salvation. Another translation which I prefer says, work hard to show the results of your salvation. Work hard, work hard, work hard. Some people say, I never knew that there was work to be done as a Christian. I thought that Jesus did all that work on the cross. Well, in salvation, yes, He did all the work on the cross. In the cross of Jesus Christ, He canceled our sin. Amen? If you believe that. But then what about conquering our sin? How do I day by day conquer the sin that I know is still part of my life? It's part of my doing, part of my acting. What do I do to be sure that I'm not losing the battle against sin day by day? On the cross, Jesus canceled my sin. What about the conquering of sin day by day? How does that happen? How does that happen? I decided today that I will tell you a little bit about how the gospel fights those front burner battles in my own sinful life. And I have a little catalog, a little summary of diagnosis that I'm willing to share with you, and I'll tell you about what is this, the real struggle of sin in the life of Ivan Blake. And it's all capsulated or summarized by this word, selfishness, which is an old ugly tree with a lot of branches. One of those branches that flows out of selfishness in my life. Now, actually, I have to tell you, I don't think any of you have a problem with selfishness because nobody here has ever told me in two years, you know, Pastor, my problem is I am selfish. No one's done that. No one has come to me and said, Pastor, you know what? I am a self-centered person. So I just assume that you don't have a problem with selfishness, but I have. I have a big one. I have a big one. The older I get more aware I am of selfishness here, not there, here. One of the branches is called frustration. The frustration has some fruits called annoyance, irritation, you know, that kind of thing. That's my problem. One of my problems. I'm only going to give you three. If I gave you more, I would just, can't stand it. It's a good thing I didn't tell you all this when I interviewed a few years ago. The you know Tell it right now. It's a bit late for you to change your minds. Well, not really too late. You can still do something about it. Impatience. Impatience has a fruit of hastiness. Too much hurry. Feeling really disturbed when things are just not moving along. That's me. It's not you. That's me. Greedy. I've got greedy. More. I always want more. More, more, more as those fruits of miserliness. Now, the thing about all this is that it all happens with a reflex. I mean, I don't wake up in the morning and say, today I'm going to be frustrated. Today I'm going to be impatient. Today I'm going to be greedy. I don't do that. Selfishness has a reflex. It kind of just jumps out of this sinful nature and Bang, there is frustration. Bang, there is impatience. Bang, there is greediness. It just comes out as part of the sinful nature that's right there. 
It's not premeditated. Reflex means it is not premeditated. I don't sit there and think, well, you know what? In this situation, the best, res the best re result or the best reaction is get impatient. Come on, Ivan Blake. Get impatient, man. You're slow about getting impatient. I don't do that. It's a reflex. It just happens. So there's my brief dialogue or diagnosis of what happens in the heart and life of Ivan C. Blake. And of course, you know what happens? It affects a marriage. My wife feels hurt rather than supported when this stuff comes out. It also affects the way, yeah, the feelings I have, yeah, you know, those tender feelings towards others begin to wilt. The energy to continue doing the challenges of ministry, they wane. It wanes because of selfishness that just pushes and pushes and comes out so often, a million times a day. Selfishness does that. So there's a summary of the diagnosis of my sins. Now, I'm not so interested in stopping the sermon right here because then I'll be in real trouble. My interest is to answer the question, how does the gospel conquer those sins. I know on the cross Jesus canceled those sins. I know He bore the penalty of those sins. I know that He took the guilt upon Himself. But what about the conquering? How does the gospel actually conquer those sins in my life? Day by day, hour by hour. See, that's what I'm interested in. And Paul said, in case you thought, well, you know, once I believe in Jesus as my Savior and my sins are canceled, everything is fine from there on out. Well, here it says in Galatians 2 verse 14, there is a way of life that is in step with the truth of the gospel. So my way of life, the way I handle situations, has got to be in step with the gospel. The gospel being that Jesus canceled my sins on the cross. That way of life. I want that way of life. Selfishness gets in the way. Paul also says in Philippians 1.27, there is a manner of life worthy of the gospel. I want to be sure that when people look at my life, my family looks at my life, my friends, they got to say, that's a life worthy of the gospel. It's not a disgrace to the gospel. He doesn't let the gospel down. Worthy of the gospel. There is a gospel walk. There is a gospel walk. And underneath all of this is the assumption, it's a clear assumption, it's an accurate assumption that we as Christians do not do a very good job in the world of walking the gospel. And there's a very good reason for that. You see, friend, the reason why there is a way of life that is in step with the gospel is because the same Jesus who died on the cross to cancel our sins, through that cancellation of our sins, His dying on the cross also provides power and enabling for us to conquer those sins, stemming from the cross. Whatever happens to conquer sin in my life is not disconnected from the cross of Jesus Christ. It is in that cross, it is in that cancellation where He unleashes the power for me to conquer those sins day by day. Unleashes that power. So what I'm most interested in today is how I can experience that power in conquering those sins in my life. And I want to make sure that you understand that the cross is the key to be made right with God, but the cross is also the key to live right with God. But we have to start with being made right with God. That is always the right beginning, because if we're not starting at how we are made right with God, we get that wrong, we're going to get everything else wrong. And I have a strong suspicion that the reason why so many Christians, including myself, so often stumble instead of walking the walk of the gospel is because we are are not solidly, totally, fully committed to how we are made right with God.
Because if you got that settled in your life, I'll tell you something, my friends. You will have your eyes fixed on the cross of Jesus, and the unleashing of that power will take place. So how are we made right with God? How are we freed from guilt? How does that cancellation take place? It happened a few years ago that in Mumbai, it used to be Bombay of India, in the great Taj Mahal Hotel, some shooting took place. Some men arrived there with guns and bombs and let them off. Shooting with their machine guns in that hotel, many people died. Great tragedy. But there was an English-born actor, an Indian actor, who was sitting in a restaurant when all this happened. When men walked into that restaurant and just started blazing bullets all over the place, he heard bang, 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 and he thought someone was busy with a celebration. Then he thought to himself, no, no, wait, there are bullets flying around here. So his friends grabbed him and pulled him down to the ground. They got under that table, and the bullets were flying everywhere, and the men were walking all over the place, just spraying bullets over the bodies of these people to make sure they did. And when it was all over, this man says, I felt I could move my hand, and I knew I was alive. There I was, face down, on the ground, breathing. All my friends were dead. I was alive. And the journalist who was interviewing him asked him, well, why do you think they didn't kill you? He says, I don't know. I don't understand why they didn't kill me. It was probably because when they came over there, spraying the bullets, they saw me covered by someone else's blood. They took me for dead. Now, because I was covered by somebody else's blood, I am alive, and I can live a new kind of life. Let me tell you, friends, that's the story of the gospel. When you are covered by somebody else's blood, you're taken for dead. Self has died, and you live, but you live a new kind of life. You walk the gospel walk. That's how we are made right with God. That's how the sins are canceled. That's the gospel story. You know, Charles Wesley taught us to sing a song where he says, yes, we are covered by someone else's blood, and he put it in his song with the words, he breaks the power of canceled sin. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing is the song. He breaks the power of what? Cancelled sin. Now, please notice that very carefully. First of all, there's the cancelling of sin. But then God isn't finished. He's cancelled the sins, but this song says, He then goes on to, what? Break the power of that cancelled sin. Now, please, realize that the wrong way to say it is, the wrong way to say it is, is that he cancels the guilt of conquered sins. You've got to get that very clear, because that's where many Christians go wrong. They think he's only going to cancel their guilt once they have conquered the sin. And then they work all their lives struggling, trying hard to conquer the sin in their own power and even calling on God's power, but it doesn't work because they haven't yet accepted the cancellation of the sin. God does not cancel your sins, taking away your guilt, only once you have proved that you've conquered that sin. That is paganism, salvation by works. He breaks the power of canceled sin. He cancels the sin. He gives that as a gift. And if that gift means anything to us, if it takes hold of our lives, we cannot sit still. We cannot just sit back and say, now everything is going to be fine. We are going to be empowered. We are going to be attacking. We are going to be fighting the fight of faith. Many times the New Testament shows how this works. And in every case, in every case, there's a power that is unleashed from the cross of Jesus for those who have their eyes on the cross of Jesus because they believe that their sins are canceled. I want to show you some examples of that. Because in other words, what it actually says is that the way the cross is experienced in 
my conquering those canceled sins is by empowering my will to oppose sin in my life. Let's look at Scripture and see how clearly that comes about. Looking at Romans 6 verse 12, 5 first and then 12, it says, We have been united with Him in His death. You see there's the cross of Jesus Christ. We are united in His death by Him suffering on the cross for us. Glorious gospel. Wonderful good news. But now notice, therefore, in verse 12, it says, Do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desires. Come on. Is that true? Is that happening? Is that happening because we have been united with Him in death? Too many people think they first have to give up every sinful desire before they can be united with God in Christ's death. That is entirely the opposite. For those who are so overwhelmed by and so absorbed by the fact that they are united with Him in the death of Jesus Christ, those people will not allow, by the power of the Holy Spirit, for sin to control their lives or give up any desire that is sinful. And the only reason why I don't do that is because I am not totally clear in my heart and my life. I'm not absorbed by it. It doesn't control me. But the fact that I'm united with God through the death of Jesus Christ. If that doesn't absorb your life, friends, nothing is going to happen in conquering sin in the life. There's another one. I want you to see this in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19 and 20. God, brought, God bought you with a high price. Does that excite you or what? How high is that price? It's the price of what? The blood of Jesus. Now, when you know that you are bought with that high price, therefore, he says in verse 20, you must honor God with your body. It doesn't say honor God with your body so that then God can pay the price for you to be saved. Not at all. He gives you that price. He saves you with that high price. And then he says, now, you must honor God with your body because you're so absorbed, you're so overwhelmed, you're so thankful. Your whole life is centered on the fact that you are bought with that price. You wake up in the morning and your first thought is, God, thank you. You bought me with that price. I can live today. I can honor you with my body, with my time, with my means, with everything today because I've been bought with a price. Thank you. It puts a smile on my face. It puts a purpose in my life and it takes me into the gospel walk. God in Christ forgave you as the cross. Therefore, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. If there's a shortage of forgiveness in our church, friends, if there is a shortage of being tender-hearted to one another, if there's a dearth of kindness to one another, I think I know the reason why. It is simply this, that the fact that God in Christ has forgiven us our sins hasn't yet taken so root that it empowers us to walk the gospel walk of being kind and tender-hearted and forgiving. I think I know why. We're not looking at the cross. So in every case, you notice the decisive force for my conquering sin is the death of Jesus Christ. Conquering sin is empowered by Christ's canceling that sin. That means simply this, the only sin that can be defeated is a forgiven sin. Oh, yes, I know my sins are forgiven. Let me tell you, if you really know it, if you really own it, you really believe it, and it means everything to you more than anything else in the world, you will conquer sin. That power will be unleashed. And so I say again, the link between the cross of Jesus and the conquering of sin in the life from day to day is the empowerment that comes from the Holy Spirit flowing from keeping my focus on the cross of Jesus Christ. 
See, God intends. Get me straight on this now. God intends that my sins will be defeated, will be conquered from day to day by a conscious opposition from my will. Through the power of the Holy Spirit that is unleashed is a response to the cross of Jesus Christ. Now, there's nothing passive about my will. I don't sit around and just wait for it to happen. When greed comes, when impatience comes, when frustration comes as a reflex, I have to engage my will. Work out, it says. Work hard to show the results of your salvation. I don't lie down and wait for a miracle. I act the miracle. And here's what I mean. If you look at that passage again in Philippians 2, verse 12 and 13, work hard to show the results of what? Salvation. Obeying God with deep reverence and fear. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases Him. As I meditated on those passages, I discovered something. I discovered that the word work hard means work hard. It means continuous, sustained, strenuous effort. I know those are dangerous words, but on their own they are mighty dangerous. But in the context of that whole passage, they are absolutely crucial. Don't work hard unless you have your eyes fixed on the cross now. It's not that God says, you're going to work hard and I'll watch you and see how well you do and then I'll reward you. Absolutely not. That's the way we seem to treat it. I also discovered that the results of my salvation has to do with conquering selfishness, frustration, impatience, Greed and all the others. Those are the results. And I also discovered that the connection between, the connection between that deep reverence and fear and God working in me is a wonderful concept of That he comes so close to me that my working and willing are actually his working and willing. (laughs) God comes so close to us. He doesn't say, come on, you've got to get working, you've got to get willing, you've got to have the desire, and that's your responsibility. No, no, no. He says, listen, I will come so close to you because your focus is on the cross of Jesus. It means so much to you. You meditate on it, you study it, you pray about it, you talk about it. It is everything in your life. I'll come so close to you that my willing will be your willing. My doing will be your doing. My working will be your working. Here is a fantastic concept. It's mind-boggling that God unites himself with us so that he will consider that the working that we do is his working, working through us. That's the way to walk the gospel. That's the way to conquer sin. That's the way Jesus wants it to happen. See, I tremble before this breathtaking concept. Tremble before it. God Almighty is in you. God is the one in you who is willing. God is the one in you who is working. And your conscious, sustained, strenuous effort is the very conscious, sustained effort of God working through you. It's God's work. It's not you sitting there with folded arms. You're engaged with God. We're cooperating with Him. Our will is on the side of His will. And you act the miracle with God working through you. I just feel like getting excited here and wonder what will happen. You know, I just wish there was no battle. I mean, wouldn't that be great to go through a whole day and have no battle with sin whatsoever? Wouldn't you love that? I wish it was that way. It's not that way. It's going to come one day, but it's not that way now. But until then, I'll tell you, I thank God that He cancels my sins on the cross and that He breaks the power of canceled sin through my Spirit-empowered will that fights with all its might, trembling, because it is God Himself who's working through me. As a professor once came to his class, chemistry class, and he said, okay, guys, here's a piece of gold. 
And I want you to take this piece of gold, and I want you to melt it. You can use any acid you like. The acids that we have tried that melts every single metal that you can think of, and it worked every time, but he said, let's try it now on gold. The same acids, just try them. And the students took that piece of gold and put it in a flask and in jars, and they put the acid in there, left it overnight, and nothing happened. Day after day, tried different acids. Nothing happened. The gold didn't change at all. All the other metals melted. And after them giving up, they thought, well, the professor's point is probably that... Um, That gold just cannot be melted. It's one of the, it's the toughest metal there. They found a more tougher one since. No, 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 he said, it's not that. I want you to try this. So he gave them a different solution. He handed them a bottle labeled nitrohydrochloric acid called aqua regia. And they dropped that gold in that jar. And as they were watching it, the gold that resisted so easily all the other acids in this, what they call royal water, the gold dissolved and vanished. Royal water. It's called that because it alone can dissolve what is called the royal metal of gold. Royal water is the master of gold. But there is another substance. Another substance that is just as impervious, just as resistant as gold. It cannot be changed. You cannot change it by education. You cannot change it by culture. You cannot change it by time. You cannot change it with your religion. You cannot even change it by reading the Bible. You definitely cannot change it by becoming a Seventh-day Adventist. And being one for 50 or 80 years doesn't change the sinful heart. Punishment, discipline, even using the will, your self-will, willpower on its own, cannot change it. Cannot change it. Can a leopard change its spots? Can Ethiopian change his skin? This solution is impervious to anything that you can do. And I want to say humbly, but with great reservation, that it might just be that some of you are still trying to change your hearts by being Seventh-day Adventists and keeping the law. Being faithful in keeping the law. It will not change your heart. There's only one thing. There's only one element that can change that sinful heart. One element only. The blood of Jesus. Boy, that was a weak amen. Can we try that again? There we go. I mean, let's come alive, Adventist people. I mean, at least by the blood of Jesus, let's come alive. Amen. I heard a little child give that kid a candy. Man. The only, the only element that can melt the sinful heart and change it to where it is a Jesus-occupied heart is the blood of Jesus. So you go to the cross to find that blood so that it will cancel the sin. But you also go to the cross, so the power from the cross unleashed in your life will conquer that sin. Day by day, in reality, no pretenses, no fake, the real thing. And if you're at the place in your life where you want nothing else but the real thing, the real thing, the gospel walk, the life that is in harmony with the gospel, 
a life that reflects the gospel. If you believe it's time for that to begin happening in your life, maybe more than ever before, maybe for the first time, then there's a song I want us to sing. And that song is called Soldiers of Christ Arise. Soldiers that work hard to show the results of their salvation. It's number 616. Don't just sing it as another song. Let it be a response from your heart. Soldiers of Christ Arise. And with that, will you arise? And let's sing it together. 